Well, welcome everyone uh, to our town hall on 988. This is Dennis Stone, director of the Center for Advocacy and Social Justice at the Jacksonville Urban League. And I'm really pleased that uh, you've joined us this evening to find out more about this very important new service that's being made available across the country uh, at uh, and locally, um, so very excited about it. Um, I, w I do want to thank uh, our interns, and with us tonight uh, we have um, Jesse McCarter, who will be facilitating, and also uh, Jamie Krasnagor, who's worked a lot behind the scenes to, to make this happen. So thank you very much on behalf of the Urban League. And with that, I will turn it over to uh, Jesse to uh, introduce our our guest. Thank you. Um, I want, just want to thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, this is a topic that is near to my heart and something that I've been very passionate about. So I'm really happy that all of you are here tonight to learn about this. Um, with us tonight is a, someone very knowledgeable in this. We have Dr. John Palmieri from SAMHSA here with us tonight. Um, Dr. Palmieri is the Senior Medical Advisor at SAMHSA and is currently serving as the Acting Director for the 988 and Behavioral Health Crisis Coordinating Office. Prior to working at SAMHSA, Dr. Palmieri was the Division Chief for Behavioral Healthcare at the Arlington County Department of Human Services. He is also a licensed physician in the Commonwealth of Virginia and is board certified in adult psychiatry. He graduated from Brown University Medical School and completed his adult psychiatry residency at Massachusetts General Hospital. Tonight, he will be talking about 988, both at the federal level and what is going on with the hotline in the country. Dr. Palmieri, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here this evening with, uh, with all of you. Uh, I'm just going to pull up some slides um, and then um, hoping that, you know, we'll have time for discussion and questions. Happy uh, to field questions once this presentation is over. Uh, hold on a second. Can you all see that okay? Yes. Okay. I think I'm good now. Uh, so yeah. So again, thank you for thank you for being here. Um, I'm going to start by uh, just basically briefly talking a little bit about overarching priorities uh, within SAMHSA, uh, and you can see here that uh, uh, these priorities actually do intersect quite a bit. So even though they're listed here as five separate priorities, there is a tremendous amount of overlap. Uh, but you can see that uh, enhancing access to suicide prevention and crisis care is clearly one of SAMHSA's top priorities um, and has been a priority um, of the, the larger Department of Health and Human Services and frankly of the White House as well. Um, for many of you who are aware, I'm sure of the um, priority on mental health uh, in the president's uh, unity agenda. Uh, so there is a tremendous amount of attention and focus and national dialogue happening around suicide prevention and crisis care. Uh, and I'm happy to talk with all of you about where 988 fits into that. Uh, I also just wanted to the right of this slide here, point out that there are a number of cross-cutting principles, issues, frames with which we need to look at how we're building out 988 in the crisis system, uh, needing to make sure that we're always um, looking at our service design, the evaluation of our services, our messaging from an equity uh, frame. We are very much focused on workforce and financing. Um, if you ask anybody in the behavioral health space, whether that's at the national, state, local level, uh, workforce is a tremendous uh, challenge uh, in finding uh, individuals uh, to staff up uh, uh, crisis centers and more, more broadly like workforce settings in general. Um, thinking about sustainable financing is something that's critically important. We um, obviously, I'll, I'll highlight some resources at the federal level and ways that states are also leveraging resources, but there is still 
more work to be done here on how we're braiding financing to support crisis services. Um, and then obviously also focusing on recovery and well being uh, in the community, um, self directed care, making sure that we're linking people both to treatment services and also supporting their overall well being and recovery. So I think it's important when we're talking about 988 um, to frame this in the, in the context of what really is a public health crisis. Uh, we know, and we experience this in our own personal lives every day through family members and loved ones, uh, that there are just so many people in this country with mental health and substance use needs who are not able to get the care uh, that they need and the support that they need. Uh, we know that there are a lot of downstream effects of those gaps in the system, including uh, the fact that suicides remain tragically prevalent uh, in this country. In 2020, there was one death by suicide every 11 minutes. Um, and that for young people in particular, suicide remains a leading cause of death. And there was a report that I just saw today or yesterday that talked about youth mortality um, over the course of the COVID pandemic and suicide, unfortunately, remains a leading cause of death and has been a leading cause of death for youth over the course of the pandemic. We also know that drug overdoses have continued to, to rise uh, over these past couple of years with the 12 month period ending in April of 2021, uh, over 100,000 people dying from drug overdoses. That number has continued to go up um, over the past year. So in that context where we know that there is just tremendous need uh, across the country uh, with respect to uh, mental health and substance use uh, service delivery, we have been very focused in on 988 as an incredible, really once in a generation, once in a lifetime opportunity to transform the crisis care system in our country. In the short term, we've been very focused in on 988 capacity. So making sure that when people contact the 988 system, either through call, chat, or text, that there's somebody on the other end, uh, a trained counselor to answer that call, chat, or text and respond to that individual, uh, provide stabilization services, uh, de-escalation services, uh, and linkages to ongoing care. So that capacity piece has been criti is critically important. And I say that um, with some emphasis because historically, uh, the Lifeline system has been quite underfunded. Uh, and so for years, there have been um, a significant percentage of calls, chats, and texts into the Lifeline system that have not been able to be answered uh, because of those resource limitations. And so with the advent of 988, um, we have been very much focused on strengthening that capacity to improve those response rates for individual in crisis. But then longer term, looking at where 988 fits in this, in this broader crisis continuum, because it's not just about 988. Uh, 988 is important but we, all, we recognize that people can not, need to have more than just 988. 988 is necessary, but not sufficient. So the service needs to be linked to other components of the crisis continuum and of the broader behavioral health continuum to make sure that people are linked to ongoing care support, that, they're, that people are not recurring, re, sort of cycling repeatedly through crisis situations because there's really nowhere else for them to go. So we really need to make sure that we're building out this broader system that provides that continuity and linkage for those individuals. And we see 988 as an, as an opportunity to advance that, that conversation and advance uh, system improvement. Uh, for those of you who may not be as familiar with the Lifeline uh, and 988, uh, just this is a couple of slides just to kind of, I think, do some level setting here. So the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline has been in existence since 2005. Uh, that has typically been accessed through that 800 number that you see on the bottom left of the slide, 800-273-TALK. That number is not going away. It's a question that we get a lot with um, the transition to 988 is can people still use the 800 number? And the answer is yes. Uh, but we do think that over time, given the ease of 988, um, that over time people will just adopt that as a simpler, easier to remember code. Uh, to access the same life-saving services. So the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline since 2005 
has grown tremendously in the past uh, 17 years. Uh, it was initially calls only. They have expanded to include now chats and texts as a way to access the lifeline. Um, they were at a, probably about a volume of about 50,000 calls when they first started in 2005. And I'll talk a little bit more about volume, but now we're talking many millions of calls coming into the system every year uh, with the projection that that's gonna continue to grow uh, with this 988 transition. And then in the past few years, you can see uh, some of the federal activity that has kind of led to this moment. So there was a designation from the FCC uh, of 988 as this new three digit number for suicide prevention and mental health crises. The National Hotline Designation Act in 2020 paired that three digit code to the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline so that became the easier portal into the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. And then just this past July 16th, so really just a few weeks ago, that transition was fully operational uh, through phone uh, and text. Chat is through 988lifeline.org. Um, but that transition happened, yeah, three, three weeks ago, so very, so very recently. Uh, so this is basically a schematic that explains how the Lifeline works currently. I mentioned 50,000 calls back in 2005 in FY21. There were 3.6 million contacts total. Uh, when people call the Lifeline, whether it's the 800 number or the new 988 number, um, they're immediately given some options. So they have a press one option to be connected to the Veterans Crisis Line. There's a press two option to be connected to the Spanish subnetwork. And then if they don't press one of those options, they're then routed to the nearest local crisis center based upon the area code that they're calling from. Uh, and we know that that always, that does not always lead to a perfect match because many of us, myself included, have cell phones with area codes that do not reflect where they are physically in that moment. Uh, but that is currently how the system is structured. There's no geolocation associated capabilities with 988. This is another question that we get a lot. 911 does have geolocation, 988 does not have geolocation. So the routing is currently imperfect uh, in the way that those calls are routed to the local centers. If for some reason the local center is not able to respond to that contact, then that call is further routed to a national backup center um, that can respond to that individual. And so that's kind of the system for calls. For chats and texts, they currently work a little bit differently. There are about 25 centers um, in the network across the country that are designated chat and text centers. And so when people, uh, uh, chat or text into 988, those are directed to one of those uh, 25 centers that are kind of a sub network um, within the Lifeline uh, network. We are moving over time to try to make chats and texts more local the way that calls are currently more local because we do think ultimately that having a local response is going to facilitate that ongoing care and that ongoing connection with local services. So the degree to which we can continue to move the system to provide more person-centered local response, uh, we think that that's going to be beneficial over time. But currently, chat and text is not is a little bit behind calls with respect to that local dissemination. We are starting. Some states have started to accept chats and texts at the local level, um, but that there's still uh, a kind of a work in progress there. Um, and we are building on this existing lifeline structure because we know that this is a system that has worked for individuals in crisis. Since 2005, there have been a lot of evaluation studies looking at the lifeline and doing follow-up studies with individuals uh, post-encounter uh, with a crisis worker. Um, and we know that the system uh, uh, helps save lives every day. These evaluation studies have shown that after speaking with trained crisis counselors, people feel less depressed, less suicidal, less overwhelmed, uh, and more hopeful. And the service is available 24-7 um, and provides confidential support. People are not required to provide any identifying information uh, to receive services through the Lifeline. Um, I wanna just shift gears a little bit to talk about what we've been federal level and within SAMHSA and the Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, so uh, about, was well, more than a year ago now, but about a year and a half ago, um, there, which was the start of the new administration, um, there was no dedicated federal structure focused specifically on 988. There was a lot of activity happening, um, but it wasn't consolidated into a sort of a single federal structure. The Lifeline network that I mentioned, uh, the funding for FY21 was $24 million. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about where that's gone more recently. 
I did talk about the challenges that we had with that $24 million funding in terms of providing uh, answer, uh, robust answer rates, uh, particularly for chat and text. We had not at that point held um, a lot of convenings or coordinated people and partners together to support work specifically on 988 implementation. And there had not been a lot of guidance materials, technical assistance, documents, learning, again, specifically focused on 90 days. So that was about 18 months ago. Um, and I'm now, these next two slides kind of review some of the things that we have done um, at the federal level with partners, because there's no way we could have done this without partners. Um, and I'm not going to read all of these, but we basically have organized our work into kind of four categories. Uh, so the first one is related to kind of appropriations, federal planning, federal convening. And a couple of things that I'll note here is, uh, well, one is money. Um, from the 24 million that I mentioned in FY21, we've gone to 432 million in FY22, uh, specifically focused on uh, 988 implementation. Uh, the president's budget proposed for FY23 is close to 700 million. And so you can kind of see a rapid acceleration at the federal level in terms of a commitment uh, to supporting uh, 988 implementation. Uh, we also have been able to stand up uh, a 988 and behavioral health crisis coordinating office within SAMHSA uh, to support a lot of the activities that are necessary to convene, to coordinate, to develop kind of an evaluation plan, to understand what data we're going to be looking at, to develop a communications plan. Those are all things that are coming out of the office now that we have a structure and a budget to be able to support some of those functions. And then we've also done a lot of work convening, pulling people together, uh, a lot of work that went into the development of um, operational playbooks or tools that can support readiness for 988 across a number of key audiences. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, on the operations side, we've used the vast majority of that funding that we received in FY22 to support capacity expansion, both getting money out to states and territories to support local capacity buildup and then also supporting the Lifeline Network Administrator. So I don't think I did say this part, but the, the Lifeline is basically a, a kind of a coalition of about 200 centers around the country. They're all independently owned and operated, but there is a Lifeline Administrator that is connected to SAMHSA through a cooperative agreement and they oversee the performance of the network as a whole. So they set training standards, they provide the infrastructure, technology, they do the accreditation, uh, they collect data and report out on that and so forth. And so that network administrator does have a key function. And so some of the funding has gone to the network administrator and through that also to some of those national um, backup functions. Uh, so the backup centers, those national chat and text centers, the national Spanish subnetwork as some other examples. So funding went in part to local states and territories for local capacity and then in part to the lifeline administrator. We also are doing a lot of work um, at the federal level. There's a lot more work to be done here around 911-988 coordination, recognizing that there's a really important piece here around coordinating with our 911 partners. One of the overarching goals behind this entire piece of crisis transformation is to get people the care that they need to minimize law enforcement involvement, to minimize emergency medical transports to emergency departments where we know that people will board for days or weeks sometimes on end. Um, and so we wanna be able to provide community-based services in the least restrictive manner possible uh, for those individuals in crisis. And so that 911-988 coordination is extremely important. Uh, we have started to do some work on the communications front that mostly has involved working with partners to, developing a mess to develop a messaging framework uh, on how and when to communicate about 988 and then more specifically to develop a partner toolkit that's on our SAMHSA website that has key messages, FAQs, branding materials, downloadable printable materials, social uh, shareables, and others that are intended for all of you that are intended for partners and communities to basically use as you see fit and disseminate them in your communities. And that toolkit will continue uh, to be built out uh, moving forward. We also did on our webpage um, put a, uh, a jobs website link so that people have visibility into the opportunities for uh, jobs and careers in crisis center work. So all of those 200 centers have links on that website 
so people who are interested in employment in those areas can, can um, get connected directly kind of in one place uh, to all the centers that are, that are throughout the nation. Um, we also are starting to do some formative research, uh, particularly for uh, populations that are at higher risk of suicide or have been marginalized and we know are facing inequities either in access or outcomes. So ultimately, we want to get to the place where we're launching a broad national awareness, public behavior change campaign that's focused on help seeking behavior. So to sort of drive people to help seeking behavior, again, with the idea that we want to decrease law enforcement response to these situations. We want to decrease um, hospital emergency department boarding. But we know that not all communities have the same access to information. They don't like to receive information in the same ways. They're, they have different influencers. They have different beliefs about health seeking behavior. They have different fears about health seeking behavior. And so we need to make sure that we understand all of that so that when we get to the point of having a national campaign, that that campaign is informed by the needs of those communities in particular. So so that we are most effective. Um, and then the last category is uh, kind of crisis services foundation. So this gets more to the piece around what happens after 988, um, because we know, as I said, that this 988 itself is not, is not sufficient. So in that broader crisis continuum, we know that there's gonna be need, need to be mobile crisis services, crisis stabilization facilities, rapid access to outpatient care, peer navigation, there's a lot of pieces to, to that continuum that need to be built out. And so this, this kind of area of activity sort of speaks to all the work that's underway with partners again, uh, to try to move all that forward. Uh, this slide just kind of captures, I mean, I think a pretty dramatic um, shift uh, in federal funding uh, for the lifeline. And you can just see going back um, many years uh, kind of where where the funding for the lifeline in particular was and kind of what we've seen in this past year um, with, with really unprecedented funds and likely if all goes as planned, a movement even beyond this in the coming years. And because of that funding, we are starting to see impacts both in terms of the number of individuals we're able to serve uh, and the response rates, how quickly we're able to respond and so forth. And so that's very encouraging. So even before the transition, uh, when those when those funds were getting out to localities and states and territories and the backup centers, uh, from February to June, we were able to serve 170,000 more individuals in crisis. And you can see kind of the distribution here across calls, chats, and texts. But this is a very positive sign that investments actually will make a difference uh, in being able to support individuals in crisis. Over the week of the transition itself, so the, over the week of July 16th, um, we saw an increase in volume by a 45% compared to the week prior. And that translated to 23,000 more calls, texts, and chats uh, that were able to be responded to by Lifeline counselors compared to the week prior. So there is a notable increase in volume as we expected with the 988 transition. And I'm happy to report that the system is moving forward to be able to respond to that demand. It's not perfect. There's more to be done for sure. Uh, but it's a very encouraging sign that investments will make a difference. Um, I just want to talk for a moment about more about the communications piece um, and what we've been engaged in in terms of our messaging and communications. We have uh, sort of flagged here a number of key objectives in our messaging, which is that we want to make sure we're highlighting progress. We want to make sure that we're managing expectations regarding the, the timeline for transformative change. We know that this is going to take time. We are making a lot of progress and we're not where we want to be by any means, but we know that this is going to take time. The 911 system has been five decades in the making, and I think we can probably all admit that it's, you know, it's evolved greatly, but it's not perfect. And so um, there's a lot of work to be done. I don't think it's going to take us five decades to sort of build out where we want to go, um, but it is going to take time, and we're trying to be realistic about that. We want to make sure that we are emphasizing the life-saving work that the crisis counselors provide every day and to spotlight that work uh, as a way to encourage people in crisis to contact the Lifeline. We want to make sure that we're supporting localities, states, territories, tribal nations uh, in their 988 implementation efforts. And again, we want to make sure that there's increasing over time broad public awareness about 988. We know that there's a long way to go here. We've seen the surveys. We know that there's a lack of public awareness on 988. So there's a lot more work for us to do there. And hopefully as we, as we continue to get resource to be able to do that kind of bigger national campaign, 
there will be lots of opportunities for us to engage both the general public and some of those communities that I mentioned earlier that we're particularly interested in reaching. And then those objectives we've been working on through a number of different kind of tactics. So we have our principals out, uh, the secretary, the assistant secretary, the 988 team um, talking with folks about 988. We have been getting a lot of media requests to speak uh, about 988 and continue to do that. And then it's all, it's about partners. It's about all of you. It's about all the partners we have, thousands of partners across the country um, who are working with us to help get the word out uh, about 988 and helping us um, ultimately build a better system. Uh, I'm not gonna go through all the top lines, but these are just more specific kind of messages that very much link to the objectives I had on the, on the previous slide that just kind of speak to how we've been talking about 988 and how we've been encouraging partners uh, to talk about 988. Um, so I'm almost done with the main slides. There's an appendix at the end, and I might just run through a couple of things just to highlight before I, I take questions, uh, but also want to let you know that um, all of the materials are on our SAMHSA website, um, samhsa.gov slash 988. That includes the partner toolkit, all like the key messages, FAQs, other resources that are on here. Um, links to those playbooks that I mentioned are on our website. They're also on the Nashville website, um, which is the National Association of State Mental Health Program Directors. Um, and they have a lot of state specific resources uh, as well on their website. And then I'm just going to run through a couple of quick things here. So this is our web page, as I said, samhsa.gov slash 988. This is where you can find a lot of those materials um, for uh, your own use and dissemination. Uh, this is just a, a list of the things that are, well, this was as of April. Honestly, this is outdated and I, should, I need to replace this slide. Um, there's, there's more stuff. Sent. I mean, these, these things are there, but there's, 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 there's more stuff as well. So I would encourage you to take, to take a look at that. Um, I did talk about the formative research project uh, that we're looking at um, for uh, populations at high risk of suicide uh, and as well as populations um, uh, facing inequities uh, in access uh, and outcomes or have, who have otherwise been marginalized um, in our crisis system. Uh, some more work to come there in forming our larger communications campaign. Um, this is the jobs webpage that I mentioned that has links to all of the 200 plus crisis centers in the country. Um, these are the playbooks. Um, well, this in and of itself isn't the playbook, but this is uh, the link to the playbooks um, that, I, as I mentioned, uh, are sitting on the Nashville website, although you can get the link through our website as well. But there's lots of information there about how you define readiness spotlighting some examples of what um, kind of innovative practices are happening around the country, um, and then resources uh, for kind of further work uh, moving forward. The playbooks are focused on uh, some key audiences um, who we think are, are critically important in, in supporting 98 implementation. So that does include states, territories, tribes, uh, the, the crisis centers themselves, the 911 centers or public safety answering points, and then the, the provider community. Um, who we see obviously is very critical to all of this work. Um, and then just a kind of a summary slide here of some of the things that we're doing around 911-988. Um, some of that is awareness building among our 911 partners. Um, we did have a forum uh, with the VA and the FCC on geolocation. As I said, 988 doesn't come with geolocation, um, but there have been conversations about are there ways that we could route callers better than we do currently with the system we have without necessarily having a pinpoint location. So those are all conversations um, that are ongoing. Uh, we wanna make sure that there's awareness in law enforcement, uh, community uh, emergency medical providers, that there's broad awareness around 988. So we're increasing every opportunity to divert to treatment, to recovery, to support um, away from, from um, incarceration. And then this kind of lays out our overall kind of map for the next five years or so, thinking again about we have the 988 implemented, we really are driving in the near term local response to 988. We do recognize that we need to over the, over the coming years continue to build out those mobile crisis services, those crisis stabilization services. The percentages here are just kind of um, touch points. The goal here is 100% for everything. 
but we recognize again that that's going to take time. So we've set some ambitious goals, knowing that we're actually a far way off in many parts of the country to even get to these numbers. But we want to make something that's going to push us uh, and challenge us in a way that's going to be ultimately vital for for people uh, in crisis. And then beneath these uh, kind of horizons or milestones are some critical principles that we think are important in everything that we're doing. Some of these I, I hinted at earlier, uh, including health first responses, equity, making sure that uh, lived experience is reflected in the way that we're thinking about service design and that the services are integrated so that the person in crisis doesn't have to sort of navigate a very complicated fragmented system that's often very siloed. We need to make it much easier for them. And I think that's it. So I am happy to uh, take questions. All right. So one, someone um, in the chat asked for um, contact information to come have someone speak to their team. Um, would you mind explaining to them where on the website they could go to request someone come speak with them about 988? Um, I'll put them, so we have a 988 team email address, which probably is the easiest thing to do. Oh, and I'll just, perfect. I'll just throw that in the chat if that's okay. All right. I was wondering um, if, you know, what the uh, likelihood and the timeline for geolocation would be. Um, I don't really have a good answer for that. Geolocation ultimately wouldn't be a SAMHSA decision. That really would be an FCC decision. Um, and so I think that there's still a lot of work to be done in terms of the conversations around the pros and the cons of geolocation. Um, I mean, there are, you know, potentially some advantages with respect to sort of if somebody's in the midst of um, an act that could potentially end their lives, then there might be some benefit, obviously, to having geolocation. But there are privacy concerns that I think we have to recognize are important uh, and that we need to address. Um, and we also need to recognize that one of the reasons that people are maybe reluctant to call 988 is because of a concern that it's too much like 911. And so if we build geolocation into the 988 system, the way that the 911 system has geolocation, that could create more hesitancy on the part of some communities to actually call 988. So these are they're very complicated issues, but these are important mm -hmm. things that we need to think through as, as we're as we're talking about geolocation. That really makes sense. We have a, another question in the chat. Um, Julia Gray was wondering if there's any specific team or partnerships that are targeting marketing for 988 towards schools and just youth in general. From a marketing perspective in particular? Or not, it doesn't have to be marketing. Is there just anything are there any, is SAMHSA partnered with anyone who's specifically focusing on getting this information out to schools, to um, even educators in schools, just youth and like the youth population? Yeah, we have been working. So within the Center for Mental Health Services, there are a number of school-based uh, grant programs and support pro programs. So we have been partnering with them and we are pretty close to releasing uh, a youth crisis document uh, that um, talks about kind of the, the SAMHSA model of the call center, mobile crisis, crisis stabilization, but more adapted to kind of a youth audience and sort of ways that we need to be um, developing the system through training, through structural changes, uh, engagement strategies that are more oriented toward youth. And so that will be kind of more of a it's not a it's not marketing per se but it is more of kind of a guidance document to kind of help localities states build out systems that are more aligned with the needs of youth and families so that should be coming out um soon uh i would like to say within the next um month or so we have um another question asking about what the qualification requirements would be for um, individuals who are answering the calls at these call centers for 988? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, 
So they vary a little bit center to center um, because as I said, these are, these are all independent, even though there are some standards uh, that are set by the Lifeline uh, administrator, the centers also have some of, their, uh, some of their own kind of standards on top of that. Um, and so um, it's gonna vary a little bit, but I will say generally speaking, you don't need to be a licensed master's level clinician. In fact, many, many, many individuals who are working in these crisis centers um, have a bachelor's degree, don't have a bachelor's degree, peer support workers. Uh, so there's a range of uh, kind of credentials and uh, experiences uh, that bring value to, to the crisis workforce. Um, and so there's not typically, you know, a minimum kind of education requirement. There's, there's a lot of training that goes in for everybody who wants to, to participate to be a crisis worker. And that's kind of across the board at all the centers. I have a question. <clears throat> I'm a little confused because I think I've heard that insurance is going to be a factor here. Um, is the 988 like services free and then the insurance is for like follow up care or is health insurance not a discussion? Because um, I've kind of heard a few different things. So. Yeah, health insurance is not, so when people call 988, they don't get asked about their insurance information. Uh, so there is not, um, it's just not a question that comes up on the 988 contact. I mean, so but people could potentially, if they have um, texting fees attached to their cell plan, like those could come into play. Um, uh, and then if they, if the 988 center if they're connected to a, like a service organization and the 988 center happens to be a component of that service organization that provides other services, then it's possible that there might be some connection to the person's insurance because they're known to the system. But generally speaking, if somebody calls 988, if you or I call 988 right now, nobody's gonna ask us what our insurance status is. It's just not a question that's gonna come up. Okay, thank you. Uh huh. I have um, a question for you. So within my, I've done some research into 988 and it, and the structure and implementation of it varies greatly between different states where they are, where they're at with that. And so I know SAMHSA offers guidelines to, and it has the toolkit for different states that they can use. But if a certain state is maybe struggling, is there a way for them to reach out directly to SAMHSA for help in maybe creating these call centers or finding funding or just figuring out how to create this continuum of care for individuals? Yeah, for sure. And so states are already doing it. So you're absolutely right that states are in very different places in terms of how they're, how they're funding 988 or the broader crisis continuum um, and kind of where they are sort of in their readiness. One of the things we do track is, um, in-state response rates, because we do think that that's important. And I mean, although all states, I think, are moving in a positive direction, they're not all in the same place. Like there are some states that have 99% in-state response rates, and there are some states that are not quite there yet. And so um, one of the ways that we, well, that we are working with states is through technical assistance through the existing grant programs that we have. So um, part of that funding that was in FY22 that I mentioned um, 105 million of that went to states and territories. So 54 states and territories received 988 awards. And so as part of that, we have um, grants project officers who are working directly with those state award recipients to talk to them about how they're implementing 988 in their states and territories and can provide ongoing technical assistance for them. The network administrator similarly has kind of ambassadors to states to support build out of the crisis system. And then a whole other separate program within SAMHSA, which is the mental health block grant program um, that basically gives funding to states uh, as part of a formula. Um, they have a, a particular set aside for crisis services and there's also opportunities to work with that program to get additional technical assistance on how states are standing up crisis services. And then the, the playbooks that I mentioned for states and territories have some additional operational guidance um, and we, I mean, people can always just reach out to us if they have questions, um, but we're very, very um, happy to work with states on supporting them, um, providing ideas, amplifying things that other states are doing um, that they could potentially learn from. I mean, you know, the environment in every state is different. And so 
but there are things that people could probably learn from. And so uh, we're happy to do that. All right, um, another question for you. Um, so one of the resources that uh, you mentioned is the behavioral health toolkit that you offer on there, on um, your website, which has like the um, FAQs, has logos and branding and all of that. Um, I also found um, on your website, your and it was at the end of your presentation where um, you have the three core elements of crisis response. Um, and I know 988 covers the first part of this, someone to talk to, but is there any um, plans to eventually hopefully expand 988 to cover these other elements of this system to eventually work with maybe um, mobile response teams or even uh, crisis centers where people can go eventually? I know 988 is very much in its infancy right now and just coming into play, but is that a possible long-term goal of this? I mean, it's definitely a long-term goal to continue to build it out. Um, there are resources already available that can help with some of that build out. And there are, again, this kind of gets a little bit to the variation across states, but there are states that already have built out a fairly sophisticated version of that model with mobile crisis dispatch from the 988 center with the option of having crisis stabilization facilities. So there are there are some states that have been kind of working at this for a while that already are pretty far along the path of kind of building out that model. And then there are other states that, you know, maybe aren't quite as far along. But I mean, to answer your question specifically, um, the mental health block grant crisis set aside that I mentioned, that is not just for 988. So many states are using that for mobile crisis services, for crisis stabilization services. SAMHSA did just put out uh, a funding announcement recently for a pilot program for mobile crisis partnerships that should be awarded, I think early in September. Um, uh, the Center for uh, Medicare and Medicaid Services also provided some guidance um, for states around planning for mobile crisis services and an enhanced match opportunity through Medicaid. You know, again, knowing that, you know, not every state is going to take advantage of that, but th these are just some examples of things that are already in they already exist um, that can support um, some of those other components of the crisis continuum. All right, I have one last question for you. If no one else, if any, um, if anyone else in the audience has any questions, you put it in the chat. You could chime in, whatever you want. Um, so nine eight eight is. Um, even though it is um, targeting not just suicide, but also mental health and substance use um, in general, I know a lot of people will, tip, will tend to associate it just with either mental health or suicide, but um, drug use is a big problem in the U.S., and I know overdose rates have been going up, and this is a big problem here, um, and I'm I don't know much about um, how crisis center workers are trained for this, but is there any difference in how and who will be able to answer calls for, say, someone calling for a mental health issue versus someone calling for a substance use issue? And for people with substance use issues, will they be able to find any resources to get help outside of 988? Yeah, those are great questions. Um, so, uh, I mean, I guess I'll start with the Kind of the scope question. So, I mean, as as I said before, so the suicide and crisis lifeline used to be the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. We changed the name intentionally because we wanted it to be more broadly open to sort of various crisis situations, including mental health, substance use crisis, really any form of emotional distress. I mean, we don't. It's not our. I think people have to define what's a crisis for themselves to some degree, right? I mean, it's not. I I can't sort of check a box and say this is a crisis and this is not a crisis. That's going to be up to the individual, and so we wanted it to be kind of as as open as possible. So I think that's part number one, uh, so that it's that it, people know that the scope is available, that the service is available to them if they're experiencing any type of distress. Two is, I mean, I think you're getting at an issue around training, which is important because. This, the, the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline historically, even though they accepted any call from anybody, even going back to 2005, who was experiencing emotional distress, it wasn't advertised as a suicide, as a substance use crisis line. Um, and so I, there is going to need to be 
uh, work to train staff um, up to be able to effectively work with uh, individuals in substance use crisis. That, you know, that already exists, you know, for some counselors, obviously. The, the, the plan is not to have, you know, the substance use crisis folks and the mental health crisis folks. The idea is to have everybody uh, with capacity and training to be able to answer a broad range of crisis situations. Um, but that's, that is going to take time because it's not something that has historically been um, an area of focus within the lifeline. And so that's part of that transformation piece that I know is, it, you know, is gonna take time. You're rightly sort of identifying that overdose deaths are a huge problem in this country. And so we do need to make sure that staff have the training and the capacity, and then also to provide those linkages. And some of that is, some of that does exist, whether that's through mobile crisis that has the ability to respond to people in substance use crisis, whether that's bringing people to crisis stabilization units that have low barrier withdrawal management services. Um, there, there are other, there are models already out there, like there's crisis stabilization units in Arizona, as an example, that um, are very well equipped to serve people, whether it's a mental health and or a substance use crisis. And so um, I think that that's just, that's just gonna be, it's gonna take time for us to sort of universally build that capacity across the country. We have a audience question. Um, someone was wondering about um, where you can go to get training the this crisis um, stabilization training, de-escalation training, if it's only, if this is only available, if you work for these um, crisis centers, or if you can go out on your own to go get this kind of training? Um, that's a good question. I mean, there are courses on crisis work. I know that there are states that are building out like curriculum uh, to support crisis work. I, I mean, a lot of the training would happen at the actual crisis center. So you know, the Lifeline has standards on risk assessment, um, responding to individuals at imminent risk, uh, and so forth. And so some of that training would be a component of working or volunteering for the Lifeline. Um, but I, I'm quite sure, although I can't identify something for you right now, but I'm quite sure that there are trainings um, on crisis work, um, courses uh, in educational institutions on crisis work, as I said, there, there has been some interest in developing like a special kind of curriculum like to lead to certification in crisis work. Um, I think that some states already have done some work in that area. I think Utah is one example that has done some work in that area. Um, uh, so I think that there's, there are more opportunities there just out, I mean, even outside of the Lifeline Centers per se. We have a, another audience question. Um, they were wondering, what the plans are moving forward to increase services across languages um, not and how a non-English speaker can get help via phone, text, call. Um, I know that you said um, that the service, it's available in Spanish, but is there plans to expand this to non-English speakers who speak a language other than Spanish, um, also in chat and text and such? Um, so that is a conversation that's underway. So as you said, calls um, for people who speak Spanish, they can access the network uh, through um, kind of the IVR menu option to be connected to the Spanish subnetwork. We are actively talking about uh, text and chat in Spanish and building that capacity uh, in this coming year. Uh, so that conversation is well underway, uh, recognizing that we absolutely want to increase language access for crisis services. For other languages currently uh, through phone, um, the Lifeline has uh, access to um, interpreter services in over 200 languages. And so for individuals calling in crisis, uh, that will also be an option. Uh, we are also looking at um, video phone for um, deaf and hard of hearing uh, individuals in crisis. Um, uh, and so that is something that we're looking to hopefully build out in the coming year as well. Um, aside from Spanish, there hasn't been a lot of specific discussion on text and chat in other languages yet. Um, I imagine that will continue to be a conversation that will continue to build out over time. The technology piece has been, and, and some of that has been just been complicated 
Um, but we are focusing on Spanish language that we do have for call. We're focusing on that chat and text. We do have the interpreter services, and then we are focusing on the video phone services. So um, in your um, last question, you uh, mentioned that for uh, crisis stabilization services, you don't it shouldn't be a specific person answering for substance abuse, a specific person answering for mental health, and that the per um, call centers should have someone who can deal with all of these different um, issues. Is this the same approach for people of different ages who will be calling in? Because I know it can be different trying to help maybe a youth who's experiencing a mental health crisis versus an adult just because uh, brains or their brain might not be developed yet. They might be processing it differently. They might not have the same support system. So is there any specific way that youth will be dealt with or will it still just be the one um, caller? Um, yeah, I mean, I think the idea behind it is that the centers would have the training to be able to work with youth callers. I mean, there are youth who are calling into the system now. Um, um, and it's, it's a population that we have, we're very focused in on when we submitted a report to Congress on training recommendations for the Lifeline Network and youth was a, was a, and substance use for that matter were, were both areas of focus uh, for us in terms of recommendations for the Lifeline Administrator to support training across staff and across the centers and providing services for youth uh, in crisis. Um, so I would see that again as something that actually there already is some capacity there for, uh, but that we would continue to build out um, kind of universally um, across the centers, recognizing that, of course, that for people to work with individuals at different kind of developmental stages, you need to have different approaches to how you engage and work with those uh, people, and there needs to be sufficient training to, for people to be able to do that. All right. Um... Is anyone has any last questions, please put them in the chat or you can unmute yourself. And if not, I am going to give uh, the mic back over to Dennis so he can um, give any last remarks and close us out. So um, I did have one question. And that is, how did you end up with this job? It sounds like one of those things where you started out in A and you ended up in Z. Um, yeah, I mean, there was there was like a like a P and like an R in there as well, you know, like it, it like it, it it just you know it just kind of I don't know it was just kind of organic to be honest because I you know again I think that there was a recognition that there was a need to have some dedicated people within SAMHSA focused on 988 because, as I said, a year and a half ago, that wasn't really the case. And so, um, uh, and so it, it, I just was kind of in the, I guess, the right place at the right time, um, you know, to kind of, to kind of make that happen. And I mean, honestly, it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's such a unique opportunity. It's humbling, obviously, to be sort of involved in something that will, I think, have incredibly enduring impact. Um, you know, for years to come and will continue to hopefully improve and serve people better. So um, it wasn't it wasn't intentional or linear, but I'm glad that I landed where I did. That's great. We're really honored that you um, agreed to, to to be our speaker tonight. It's it's been a, a great learning experience for us all. And I think as you as you sort of imply, this is just the beginning. And, um, you know, five years from now, we'll all remember this evening because of what the work that you and many people like you are doing. So we're really grateful that you're doing it. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think about that, like in terms of like, you know, younger and people much younger than I am, like who like will grow up with 988 and it'll just be so like commonplace for them. And that's like, that's amazing. I mean, I think no. that's amazing. Some of us were around. In fact, we had a a, a, a mental health uh, workshop uh, town hall, and I sent I put a link in uh, to the video, and one of the persons there um, mentioned it, and then it came up again, and, and the second time it came up, it was 
one of the women who was the first 911 person in Jacksonville. And uh, it was through her that we, we learned more about it. And um, so anyway, we're really uh, grateful. And again, I'm also grateful that Jesse uh, put this together along with Jamie and others and Julie Miller, uh, also an intern at the center. Uh, we're, we're so grateful. And uh, I put a, uh, in addition to the video link, I put a link to a uh, workshop that we're co-hosting tomorrow at, at noon on it's a career talk. Um, so uh, spread that word about that to your friends. And, uh, and also, I invite all of you on a monthly basis, we have a racial healing and reconciliation conversation uh, the first Thursday of the month and uh, at seven o'clock. So you're all invited to attend our next one. Anyway, thanks again. Thanks, everybody, for being here. And uh, on behalf of the Urban League, um, I wish you all a, a great week and a great year. Thank you all. Thank you for your presentation.